Good morning, Providence. Certainly an extraordinary time. Crazy week, crazy weeks. We really don't know where this is going, but in an effort to seek to honor those in authority over us, which is what Romans 13 talks about, we've decided to move to a mobile format for a short time, for a very brief time. We're going to record the sermons. You'll receive those so you can watch them on Sunday, as well as a worship guide. We would encourage you. While we're trying to come under the, the 10 people uh, limit, we are at the same time encouraging you. We would love for you to have another family over and watch this together if you feel comfortable with that. We're going to try Zoom for our small groups. So people are already trying to line up and get connected in through Zoom. And we encourage you to stay connected through your small group, to go through the worship guides together, to pray together. In fact, our challenge over these next couple weeks is to reach out to, we want to encourage each of you to reach out to two individuals at Providence each week and pray with them, encourage them, find out how they're doing amidst all that's going on. So our goal is to actually intensify our fellowship even while we have canceled our corporate gatherings for a brief time. Now if it continues or persists for very long, as may well be the case, our backup plan is to have worship services outdoors at Jubilee Ranch on Sundays. For those who can make it and for those who can't, we will again record it. So we love you. God loves you. We're thankful that you're with us this morning to go through the Word together. And we encourage you to keep fellowshipping together. Now, before we jump into the message this morning, uh, in the midst of this, there seems to be a lot of questions. What is the appropriate response for Christians when here we're to be in fellowship and some churches are closing and some aren't? And Certainly, what do we do with, should we still shake hands? Should we, uh, is it okay to wear masks around one another? Or whatever the case is. And again, this comes back to what Romans 14 says. There's not a right or wrong. You have to make decisions that you think are appropriate. You need to pray through those decisions and what you think is both prudent and wise, as well as meets those uh, requirements to continue to connect and fellowship. And so whether that's through Zoom or whether you feel comfortable having another family into your home and worshiping God together, whatever the case is, we're not trying to judge one another. We're trying to allow a flexibility of conscience on this in the Romans 14 sense. And we love you. And we're looking forward to all being back together soon. So we're taking a break from 1 Corinthians. And in order to really deal with Christ and the coronavirus, how do we as Christians function in the midst of the chaos and the sort of global meltdown that is the coronavirus and the economic downturn as a result. Well, certainly, we don't want to join into the mob mentality so that they now have security guards guarding toilet paper and all the craziness. You go, wait a minute, how do we not get caught up in that frantic, crazy mob mentality that's just reactionary to everything that comes? and instead walk in peace. In fact, I think that's what God wants for you. It's what God wants for me. He wants us to walk in peace. And I think that sets us up to be a testimony to a watching world in an amazing way and gives us opportunities for the gospel in, in, a, in a crazy day that we might likely not have if things were much more calm and much more business as usual. But I do believe peace is a biblical response to the coronavirus. Because we can't control what happens, but we can control who we are. And we're people who have been given God's peace. And so, I want to start with a verse out of John. John chapter 14 and verse 27. We're going to jump around. We're going to deal with a number of different verses this morning. But John chapter 14 and verse 27 says this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That's a good word for us. Did you realize that God had given you peace? It might seem strange because you say, well, isn't peace an emotion? How could God leave that with me? How could God give that to me? But if God has given you peace, you need to be asking, are you functioning in peace? When people look at the variety of people around you, do they look at you and say, they're peaceful. They're at rest. They're trusting God. You see, peace and walking in peace is what God wants from you and I in the midst of the coronavirus. And so we need to understand how to experience that peace that God has given us already. And so, 
In Romans, it starts really with our relationship with God. That's why we couldn't come to an unbeliever and say, hey, you just need to experience God's peace. Um, here's some verses, trust this. They first need to come into a right relationship with God because Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, having been justified or declared right with God, right, by faith, we have peace. Peace starts through justification. It starts when you get saved. It starts the moment you get saved. When you are declared right with God, you have peace. Hmm. In fact, Jesus was punished so that we could have peace. In Isaiah 53, 5, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And so it was Jesus being punished for our sins that allowed us for the first time to experience true peace. We need to bring this message to the world. Even in the midst of the coronavirus, when people may be reluctant to shake your hand or let you into their home, we need to be strategic in thinking and praying, how can we reach out to the hurting, scared people around us who really need peace with God more than they need anything else? Because that's the one virus that will kill all humanity. And the only cure is Jesus Christ. But if you'll remember, the first time humanity ever felt fear was back in the garden, after Adam and Eve sinned. After they sinned, they felt fear when God showed up, and they hid themselves. And so, fear came as a result of sin, and the destruction and damage it brings to our lives may bring a whole lot of fear. And certainly, in Hebrews 2.15, it says, People are scared and fearful all their lives of death. So we're ultimately, or mankind without Christ, is ultimately, ultimately scared about death. And certainly the coronavirus brings that to light. And still, many of you might think, man, I know God, I've been saved, but I'm fearful. I'm, I'm looking at my job situation, I'm looking at my financial situation, I'm looking at my health situation, I'm looking at these things, and, and, and I know that God has brought me peace with Him in a salvific way, but I'm not experience, experiencing peace in a practical way in my life. And I believe God wants you to walk in peace. I believe he wants you to experience peace. And so let's talk through that. The penitent woman who wept at Jesus' feet found peace. In Luke 7, 50, he says, And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Or in Psalm 4, 8, he says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. That's important because David wasn't writing this in some lap of luxury where everything was going smoothly. In fact, he had very real enemies, very real dangers, very real uh, dangers that would, could easily take his life. And yet he's saying, man, I sleep well. I sleep in peace because he had found such trust in God. And so you need to know that. In fact, 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out, it casts out fear. Perfect, perfect love casts out fear. So if you want to live in peace, you've got to understand God's love for his people. Because when we feel fear, we grab for something. When we, we grab for stacks of toilet paper, we grab for canned goods, we grab for ammo, you name it, we grab for something. But what God says is, when you start to feel fear, you should grab for the love of God. You should remind yourself of the love of God. Perfect love casts out fear. If you recognize and understand this being we call God and his infinite and perfect love for you, then you can walk in peace even when the world is in chaos. Hmm. Because love, God's perfect love for you promises you peace. So, if you're fearful and anxious, God wants you to rest. He wants you to find peace. Not because you're saying, well, I, I, I still have two full packages of Charmin tissue and, 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 and weeks worth of instant Starbucks coffee. No. That's not the peace he's talking about. In fact, if that's your peace, then you're probably going to be pretty stingy with those things anyways because soon as somebody wants their needs, some of those things, well, I can't, can't give that up. That's my peace. That's my security. God's love, God's perfect love for you, that needs to be your peace. In Psalm 85, 80, says this, I will hear what God, the Lord, will say, for he will speak peace to his people. 
to his godly ones, but let them not turn back to folly. So do you, do you understand kind of speaking peace to you right now? Do you understand that tomorrow morning, instead of getting up and, and, and listening to CNN and listening to Fox and listening to all these news channels, that you should get up and listen to God speak peace to you? Do you know that God wants to speak peace to you? Do you know that all that he's written and all that he's revealed should bring peace to you? Mm. So God is speaking peace to you today. And he wants you to experience peace. And that begins by and requires that we let the Spirit control us. In Romans 8, 6, he says, For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. If your mind is set on fear and all the fleshly worries, it's death. In fact, fear is not going to help you. Fear will not serve you. Fear will not point you to God. But the Spirit, but the Spirit, the mind, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. There seems to be a lot of confusion in our day what the Spirit is and who He is and what He does. But He says, but the Spirit, if your mind is set on the Spirit, how do you set your mind on the Spirit? The Spirit is invisible because the Spirit has spoken through the Word of God. So if you're listening, if your mind is set on the Spirit, your mind is set on the Word of God, it's set on what the Spirit has revealed to us about Jesus. That's what the Spirit does. It reveals to us about Jesus Christ. And your mind set on the Spirit is peace. You want peace? Set your mind on the Spirit. And what will happen is, the fruit of the Spirit is one of the results. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You see how God is speaking peace to us? You see a mind set on the Spirit it's a mindset on the Word of God. It's a mindset where the, the Holy Spirit is controlling our life consistent with the Word of God, directing us consistent with the will and ways of God. And as a result, we experience peace. We experience peace. And so, Isaiah 26, 3 through 4 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. It, it's, you will not be kept in perfect peace by keeping your mind stayed on the stock market. You will not be kept in perfect peace by keeping your mind stayed on the virus. You will not be kept in perfect peace by letting your mind stay on the latest news. Now, I'm not saying you can't watch the news. I'm not saying you can't listen to the news. I'm not saying you can't keep up with what is going on. But your mind needs to be stayed on the Lord. And so we need to stop obsessing over the news. Any of you obsessing over the news? Just constantly, news, news, news. Nothing wrong with being informed. Be careful. Our mind should be stayed on Christ. Our mind should hourly be just focusing in on Christ, on the sovereignty of God. Mm. And not only focusing our minds and our hearts on the promises of God, we also need to be prayerful. This is what Philippians chapter 4 and verses 6 through 7, Philippians 4 and verses 6 through 7, a passage probably familiar to all of us, or at least most of us. But it's super important. He says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, he says, Be anxious for nothing. You say, wait a minute, that's easy to say when everything's going well. But when there's problems, not so easy. In reality, in this life, we will have trouble, the Lord said. There's always trouble. It's just that there's sometimes seasons where there's a lot more trouble. And as a nation, as a city, as, as the world population, certainly we're facing more trouble right now than at other times. But there's always trouble. So if you're waiting for troubles to go away, to not be anxious, to be at peace... You will not experience peace. That's not what he's saying. In fact, he's giving a command. Be anxious for nothing. That's, this is actually a command. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made to known to God. And the peace of God. Remember he gave us his peace? Here's how you experience it. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, you will have a peace that everyone around you goes, I don't even understand. Well, how can you be at peace? Why would you be at peace? We're, we're, we work for the same employer. You're facing the same layoff. Or uh, we, we have a similar situation financially. Or we have a similar health issue. Or, you know, whatever. Why are you at peace? And hopefully this brings you an opportunity to say, I have the peace of God. I have the peace of knowing that I know God. And more importantly, He knows me and loves me. But be anxious for nothing is, is a command that we often just forsake. If we were commanded, don't kill anyone this week. You would say, okay, I got that, I got that. Um, don't kill anyone this month. You'd say, well, okay, I got that. Don't, don't 
I'm killing him this year. He said, okay, I got this, right? But when he says, don't be anxious, we go, oh, that's impossible. The reality is, we can actually walk in peace. We're commanded by God to walk in peace. We're commanded to turn over those things. When we start to feel the temptation towards anxiety, or maybe we give way to the temptation, and we allow our minds to think on the what-ifs, and we sin against God in those ways, we need to instead take these things back. When we start to feel the temptation to worry, we need to immediately turn that over to God and say, no, I'm going to walk in peace. That's God's word to me. I'm going to walk in peace. That's God's command to me. I'm going to walk in peace. I'm going to turn these things over to him, let him handle them, and I'm going to walk in peace. That's what God's told me to do. So we need to know that. So we need to be praying. We need to pray. Every time fear starts to rise in your heart, you say, no, I'm not going to fear. I'm going to walk in peace. That's not to say, that's not to say that you can't make wise decisions. That's not to say that we, hey, if you're prayed up, you don't have to wash your hands and you can go wherever you want to go, whatever. It's not to say that. We still need to be wise. But what he's saying is, be wise, pray, trust me in all things, and then be wise. Walk in wisdom. Follow my spirit's lead, right? And it, all of this comes back to the fact that we serve the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He rules over all things. And as his subjects, he is controlling, working all things for our good. And we can be at peace because even though we can't control the situation, we know the one who does. Hmm. And if you think about where Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is right now, really Isaiah 6 is a beautiful description of that. He's seated on a throne being worshipped. And he's being worshipped by people and by angels and by angelic beings that are not worried in the slightest. You say, well, I wouldn't be worried either. I were right there, worshiping God. I wouldn't be worried. I'd just be worshiping and praising in peace. But do you recognize that God is right there next to you? Right there on your couch, that you're right there in your room, right there where you're at, that he's right there with you. That's the testimony of Scripture. You can be at peace. God will never leave you nor forsake you. But in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hmm. Important to know that. Important to believe that. Important to recognize that. God's with you. God's got this. Isaiah 57, in verse 19, he says this. Creating the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord. And I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. Its waters toss up refuge in mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And so there's a distinction between God's people who are trusting him and walking in peace and finding renewal and finding healing. And those who have rejected him, rejected his word, do not believe in him, will not turn to him. And he says they're like the shifting waters. They, there's no rest. They're just restless. And, 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 and he says, no, but, but, but we're the people of peace. The people of peace. Mm. And so, in the midst of this, we are to tell the world what Ephesians 6 15 says is the gospel of peace. It's the gospel of peace. What does every person around you need more than a cure for the coronavirus, more than a financial bailout? They need the gospel of peace. They need to come into a relationship with their creator, with their maker. And find his love for them, his perfect love for them, to overwhelm them and cause them to want to come follow and listen and obey him. But be careful, there's certainly plenty of false teachers out there, like always, who would like to capitalize on this. James had sent a link over to a, a false teacher over in Louisiana that is uh, offering out anointed handkerchiefs to help you with uh, dealing with the coronavirus. So many other false teachers are claiming Psalm 91, 6. Where if you just if you just claim this and you believe this, that nothing can attach to you, you cannot face, you will not get ill. But again, these are just false teachers offering what Jeremiah would say is a, a false hope. In Jeremiah 8, 11, he says, They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially, saying, Peace, peace, but there's no peace. So the false teachers are trying to capitalize on this opportunity as well offering a false speech, twisting the word of God to make it say what it doesn't. The fact is, God is in control. God protects us, 
And God will keep these things away from us unless he desires or decides to allow us to go through difficulty, which difficulty is certainly one of the things that God often uses to develop us and make us like him. That's why Paul had a thorn in the flesh that after praying three times and wasn't removed, he realized that God was doing a work and humbling him. And so we need to recognize through this time that God is humbling us, that God is drawing us near, that God is allowing what he allows for a purpose that he has for us and that his purposes are always good to us. He's some good to all, that's us, and all he's some good to all, that's the world, and all good to some, that's us. He's always good, everything's good. Everything that you're facing will ultimately turn out for good, and you need to know that, and that should drive peace in your heart. That's Romans 8, 28, 29. Hmm. And so, instead of claiming, naming, and claiming Psalm 91, we pray, we trust God, we pray for health, we pray for the finances, we pray for one another, we encourage one another, we wash our hands, we make wise decisions, we know that God's walking with us, that God's providing for us, that God cares for us, that God loves us perfectly, and that he's going to walk with us through all of this. And then his purposes are that we become more and more conformed to the image of his son, Ephesians 5.1, but also that we be the mouthpiece for God and the example of God here on this earth. So we need to be about his work and proclaiming his gospel. So I believe that God wants you and I to walk in peace. I believe his word to us is peace, that he is speaking peace to us. And so I would just encourage you that when you think of the most peaceful person in life, when you think of someone who is, who is living in perfect peace, I hope you come to mind in certain people's lives and the people around you, when they think of someone peaceful, they think of you. That you are actually believing the word of God and at peace. I believe that's God's word to you. I believe God wants you and I to walk in peace. And so this week, I just encourage you, stay in the word. Don't obsess over the news. It's fine to keep abreast of what's going on, but focus your mind on the spirit and what he's saying to you about God through the word of God. Stay in fellowship, stay connected. Encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called day. Call one another, text one another. In small settings, get together, encourage each other. Get on Zoom. Spend time with your small group this week. Love on them, pray for one another. This is a great opportunity for us to build fellowship and to reach out to others in our fellowship that may not be as regular. This is a good opportunity to draw those in as well. God loves you, love you. We're looking forward to being back together corporately. So this brief stint, hopefully uh, we it comes uh, to an end sooner rather than later, and certainly, as we said, there's a backup plan. If these things persist, we'll start trying to meet outdoors in a worship service. So we thank you for listening. We hope you have a, a great week in the Lord, walking in peace.